Hey there, and welcome back. We're so glad you're here for another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Thrilled to have with us again, Dana Skurlock. She joins us from Staffing Boutique, where she's Director of Recruitment. She's brought a conversation to us that I cannot wait to get nerdy about, modern resumes for the digital age. So Dana's got some great insight that she's going to share with us. But before we pass over the microphone, we want to remind all of you who we are, if we've not met you yet. Julia Patrick is here, of course, where she serves as the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. And I'm Jarrett Ransom, nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. Honored to be here alongside Julia. And thanks to these amazing presenting sponsors that allow us to continue these conversations like we'll, we are about to have with Dana so shout out of gratitude to our friends over at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, of course, Staffing Boutique, again, where Dana joins us from. Mm -hmm. Also, thank you to JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. So again, thank you to these companies because they allow us not only these conversations, but also the archive where you can find all of our multitudes of conversations, including previous ones with Dana and our partner, Katie, uh, over at Staffing Boutique. So go ahead and Take out your smartphone. You're probably texting or typing on it now, but scan that QR code and you can download the app and you can still find us on the streaming broadcast and the podcast channels. So Dana, welcome back. You, Yeah, you join us regularly and we always love to have you. But for our viewers and listeners that maybe might be joining us for the first time, uh, you are hearing and possibly seeing Dana Skurlock, Director of Recruitment at Staffing Boutique. Welcome back, Dana. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be here. And thanks for having me on again. I'm so excited about today's topic. It's one of my favorite. <laughs> you know, Dana, it's a, a New Year's kind of Q1 topic, resumes, because so yeah. many people say, okay, I'm going to you know, get a new job or I'm going to make a change or whatever. And exactly. so I think this kind of pops up, but, and you and I had decided this, we were going to do this show and lo and behold, last week in the New York times, there was an article about digital re resumes and it was kind of chilling because it, it followed this trajectory. Um, talk to us about what the entire digital piece of this looks like before we start asking you specific questions. Sure. And I'm so glad that you mentioned this article earlier when we were just in the waiting room, we were discussing it and um, I haven't read it in depth yet. So I you know, definitely want to get a hold of it and take a look at it. But I think it's going to be interesting as my feedback on resumes is very anecdotal, just the function of having looked at so many over the years and screening so many candidates versus like, you know, the New York Times, I'm sure has done a very comprehensive, like data focused study on it. And so I'll be interested to see how our opinions kind of line up. But just to give folks listening at home a little background on, you know, where I started career wise, I began as what we call a candidate recruiter or a recruiting assistant in um, the staffing industry. And so essentially what I was doing is I was receiving hundreds upon hundreds of resumes. Mm -hmm. My job was to review all of them, siphon out who was appropriate for the jobs that we had on file or that were open currently, and then start making outbound calls and pre-screening those candidates on behalf of the firm. And so during that time, I probably screened thousands of resumes, you know, over the course of like the two and a half years I was a candidate recruiter. Um, now that skill never goes away when you're still in recruiting, you're still reviewing resumes daily. So when I first started in 2008, the logistics of what it looked like to review hundreds of resumes was that I had to go print out a ton of resumes, manually review them. Um, and then, you know, yeah. from there, add them into a system, into a database system of who I was interested in moving forward with or people that we wanted to save for later, perhaps. Um, and so because of the manual nature of that, I think resumes being um, one page, for example, like that was sort of the adage that we all got from the time, probably we were in high school and we were doing sort of those home ec <laughs> job training classes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, we were told you could only have a one page resume. 
I think that that made sense up until, you know, maybe the 2010s um, when now I, I never review a resume by paper. Even when I go to career fairs um, and I'm in person meeting with people, I'm able to get a digital copy from them pretty instantaneously. And, and also just in thinking about using as little paper as possible, you know, containing resources. We don't want to go back to printing, you know, hundreds of documents for, you know, a disposable type of usage for it. So I think that it's great that everything's digital now. What that lends itself to, though, is, is that we don't have to confine ourselves to just one page. And if for my money, when I'm reviewing resumes, I would rather have more information than less. Um, and I think having candidates sometimes with 15, 20, 30 years of experience, even as little as five to seven years of experience, it's really hard to keep it to one page. And so you're really getting sort of an anemic description of what their background is to be able to make a hiring decision quickly. And with everything being as, you know, so quick these days, everyone wants jobs filled right away. Candidates want feedback right away. Um, you know, we're expecting information to travel very quickly. We, I think, are are doing ourselves a disservice by sending out resumes that don't have all the information on them, because what that means is that the person reviewing them can't really assess your full background. And so more likely than not, you'll just be discarded and not called back for further interviews or even to get your foot in the door to even get a, a phone interview to start unless you have enough information on the resume for the for the person reviewing it to, to go off of. And so I... Obviously, there's a limit to that. We don't necessarily want to see six-page resumes or five-page resumes. So you don't want to be overly verbose or mm -hmm. over-explained, but um, definitely making sure that you take the time to give a detailed analysis of your previous work and experience, even if that goes over one page, is going to be really paramount. Mm -hmm. Dana, I have to ask you, because there's this platform, you might have heard of it, this is sarcasm called LinkedIn, right? Of course. <laughs> and I feel like our digital resume is constantly available. Um, it is constantly looked at whether we're really seeking a new opportunity or not. True. So mm -hmm. I feel like this digital resume, like it has moved beyond even sending it into a possible employment opportunity it resides as really our like trophy case, if you will, online. How how does that play a role as a reference, I want to say, to job seekers? Sure. I think that LinkedIn has become a wonderful resource um, in terms of getting information about candidates very quickly to hiring managers and getting um, information to job seekers too, for your my money, because you know we're on the staffing end. I think that where it can become tricky is when people are utilizing LinkedIn in place of an actual CV or resume. So mm -hmm. for example, I'll have candidates come contact me and say, I'm interested in hearing about what jobs you have, or I'm interested in you know, moving into a new position this year, here's my LinkedIn profile and not attach a resume at all. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are some people who are sort of ahead of the curve, and using LinkedIn in place of a resume. And then you've got people that don't have enough information on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I think my goal with any when I'm working with a candidate is to make sure that the resume, the actual hard copy resume that you're sending in places and the LinkedIn record tell the same story. So mm -hmm. where LinkedIn has a lot more visual aids, where LinkedIn, you can get more of a snapshot. You don't want it to be so um, incongruent with what your actual resume is mm -hmm. that people are asking you for, you know, a CV after they look at your LinkedIn and then it's kind of a completely different focus on your resume or vice versa. Because right. um, right. when you send your resume in, nine times out of 10 hiring managers are probably going to your LinkedIn and mm -hmm. then reviewing your information there, at least at some point during the interview process. It might not be from moment one when they get your resume or even on the first interview, but eventually they're going to be looking for it. And expecting to see one, you know, as well. I think there's some candidates too that have um, websites devoted to their freelance work. Like let's say if you're in marketing or communications, it's super helpful to have an online presence. And what I would say is that what's most important is, is making sure that all of those sources tell the same story about your background and what it is that you want to be doing next. So if you are wanting to move into, let's say higher management, upper management within a nonprofit, and your LinkedIn profile doesn't reflect that, 
it's hard for people to sort of see you in that next position that you're applying to get promoted into. So I think for transitional candidates, it's really pivotal. I think when you're headhunting someone who is, you know, a CEO and has been for the past 10 years or something, um, you know, it, it, it can be something where you can, um, kind of have some, some flexibility, but, um, I really, I, I love LinkedIn. I think it has become a bit of a social media minefield. Like people are posting things that are not business related so right. much anymore, but I do think that the core of it is still super helpful for job seekers and, um, hiring managers alike. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to see how people are utilizing a LinkedIn profile almost as their calling card instead of business cards. I used to have Yes. Physical business okay. cards I would go to luncheons with and things. Now it's just find me on LinkedIn, find me on LinkedIn, you know, yeah. message me there. Yeah, and you can scan and do all these things. Well, it brings me to the quality versus quantity. So, I mean, even I, as a consultant, you know, am asked for my resume. And I, I will say I just use the PDF version of LinkedIn because it's up to date and, you know, and that's kind of mm -hmm. what I'm doing, but I'm not seeking true, you know, full-time employment so for those that are, talk to us about the the two cues, right? And how they battle one another. So quality versus the quantity. What does that look like now when it comes to sending our resumes? Sure. I think, you know, in previous years, when you were, let's say even, you know, mailing a resume in, I used to get them by hard mail and into the yeah. office when I was a candidate recruiter. This is back yeah. in like 2007. Um to faxing resumes, to, you know, having to print resumes out. There mm -hmm. was a cost associated with being a candidate and sending out resumes and having to print them and send them. And I think people proofread very, very carefully. They made sure that the resumes were in the absolute best shape possible because they knew that it was going to cost them money to have these applications put out there. Mm -hmm. I think that with the digital age and things becoming so accessible, some of the quality has waned to some degree because I'll get hundreds of resumes. And whereas I may only see one resume with a typo or a spelling or a grammatical error, I'm seeing, you know, swaths of them with mistakes in them per like, let's say hundred resumes I'm seeing. And I think some of that is just that we're all quick on the phone. We're doing things fast. We're spelling things quickly. We have spell check for most things we're texting. And so we're using slang and certain acronyms and things that, sometimes fall into business emails and resumes. And I think that can dilute people's applications um, because even with me catching everything, you know, I was an English major, so it's a little <laughs> bit easier for me than some people. <laughs> even with me looking out for things, some things are going to fall through the cracks and it can be the difference between you getting an interview for a job or not. Um, so that said, how I feel about making, if you're in the position where you're looking for a new full-time salaried position and you know that those are competitive to get um, and you're in the midst of the job search, I would rather send out five really high quality, well thought out, tailored resumes to the particular job you're applying to than if you're able to crank out 20, 25, uh, you know, in a week just to get 20 to 25 out because it's more about the retention or the, the response rate so you know how we judge emails now, marketing emails by how many people opened it, how many yeah. people responded back. Yeah. That's the kind of data that we're crunching, right? Um, mm -hmm. And most companies are. It's the same thing with the resumes. I think it's much more important to see how, like what percentage of resumes that you send out are getting a hit back versus that you're sending out, you know, so many a week. And if you're not hearing back, that's when you can kind of diagnose there's something going on with the way that I'm submitting my resumes. I often will advise candidates that I'm speaking with to tailor their resume to the particular job because inevitably what ends up happening is that someone will apply for a job. And because I'm a recruiter, I have more time than most hiring managers to be on the phone speaking with them about the job, right? Because most right. hiring managers, they're only talking to the top few people that they really think are a fit. So most people don't get a call back. So because I have a little bit more time, I can spend a little bit more time like kind of judging the resume and talking to them about their background. Inevitably, people will tell me things like, well, I actually did work at an organization like that. It was five years ago, but it's not on my resume because blah, 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 blah. There's always like a slew of reasons why they didn't put it. <laughs> and my question is always like, well, if you knew you were applying to this job before you sent your resume, why is that not incorporated? And their response is usually always, I just didn't think to. Or during this conversation with you is when I sort of remembered this volunteer experience that I have that pertains to this or 
if it's an international organization, oh, I, I actually lived there for six months, mm -hmm. you know, in the region that this international organization works with. Those are things that need to be in your cover letter, in the resume, incorporated into your email to the clients and the hiring manager so that they can actually see that. Because if it's not on your resume, it's as good as if you never did it because you may not get to the next round to mention it. Um, and so that, but then I am sympathetic because I do understand that takes a lot of time as a job seeker to sit and tailor each resume and to really tailor each cover letter. Because what I'm usually getting are sort of canned cover letters with a different name, you know, applied each time in a different address, but the content is usually pretty much the same. Um, I personally am not a huge fan of cover letters, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so for all of that, I would say if you spend the time that you would spend applying to 50 jobs to really taking your time and, and, thinking about, okay, here's what this job is requiring. Here's what this organization says they're about. How can, the things I would say during an interview, if someone were to call me now saying, hey, I want to meet with you about this job. That's what I they need to see in my resume and where you can incorporate it more than once. So for example, if you're applying to something that has to do with database work or some sort of technical skill, mentioning it once in the skills section is great, but what would be even better is if it's in the skills section, and you have a bullet point about it on the job that you use the software and outlining what you did with it day to day, what version it was, where you were trained on it at a previous job, you know, having it so that when they're looking for that database or for a certain technical skill, it's coming up three to four times on your resume. They're going to call you if they see your resume, if it's that compelling. Um, but if you just mention it once or not at all, and people will have things not on their resume at all and say that they know something or have skills in something. And so it's hard to reconcile that both on my end and also when I submit a resume to a client, they the pushback I'll often get is, I, I just don't see how this person has expertise in this if it's not on their resume. Right. And then I can't get the person an interview, even if they do have the experience. Right. So that's why it's important. You know, it's such a fascinating um, topic. And, and especially when we think about um, the amount of time we spend on the nonprofit show, talking about relationships, talking about relationships and fundraising, keeping our staff, I mean, serving our clients. And I'm wondering if when we back back up a little bit on the quantity versus the quality issue, how do you feel about follow-up? You know, doing that, did you get my resume versus just sending it off and, you know, the pray and spray kind of concept, hoping that somebody responds. What do you, what's, what's your sense of that? Like, are you like, get away from me. I'll, I'll let you know if I'm interested or does that bump that person up? Um, I think it, it, it can go both ways as you're describing. Mm -hmm. I think that if you're working with a recruiter, we're used to hearing back from candidates far more often than actual okay. hiring managers with internally at a nonprofit. Um, and since we are sort of an impartial third party, I encourage candidates to follow up with me if, if they ever are like concerned or if they're worried about their application. 99.9% .9 of the time, the issue is just that I have not heard back yet. And so they're going to get a, a quick answer from me saying, hey, I haven't heard back yet. I will let you know as soon as I do. But I don't mind that because I understand that they've been engaged and we've submitted their resume and I have no problem hearing from them. I think it's tricky when you're applying on your own to something. Okay. You don't want to follow up too much and become a pest. Um, and you don't want to follow up too soon because I think the thing to remember is most people are not recruiters. And so they don't have all day to work on hiring the way I do. So <laughs> they're doing all of their other job duties. And then on top of that, they have two positions in the department that they're working on. So responding to resumes is important for them, but it's not the number one job duty that they're completing at any one time. And so it can take them some time to go through those responses. So just being patient with them, I would say following up no sooner than like a week since oh, okay. you know you've you've applied maybe even two weeks if you I would say if you've looked at a job listing and it has a specific email address that you sent your resume to since it's going to a specific person I think a, you know following up after a week and then waiting a couple more weeks and then maybe sending one last check-in I think could be good okay. I think that any more than that and you're really going to become a pest and 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 clog up their inbox versus something that's sort of reasonable. But again, it's it's it depends on the hiring manager, their personality. If they're somebody who wants, let's say it's a development job where being persistent is part of the job, they might look to see people that follow up. 
if it's a position that's more administrative or in finance or something, right. the hiring manager may find it more off-putting. So unfortunately, there's not like a canned like answer for this, mm -hmm. but I would say that most hiring managers and most job ads now are doing a, a better job of outlining what the process will be for the hiring. Okay. So yeah. if it says in the email, we will contact you if we're interested, that's a sign that you don't need to follow up. If it doesn't say anything like that, I would say, you know, a week or two afterwards and you follow up one time, perhaps a second time to follow up and then that's it. I think that's more than reasonable. And sometimes I do look at, you know, somebody followed up and, and they send a nice message and they say that they're very interested. Maybe give me a specific reason they're really interested and that's why they wanted to follow up. Okay. That's something that I may say, okay, let me bump this person up because they're clearly engaged and they've done the research and looked into, you know, uh, the job description thoroughly and said, Hey, I'm really excited about this, about the job. That's why I wanted to follow up with you. That, that again, it goes back to quality versus quantity. Like if you're just sending out, Hey, I sent my resume last week, please let me know sincerely. Mm -hmm. So-and-so means far less than, you know, a, a very specific email that's addressed particularly to a person and has more details in it. So as part and parcel to that, we got a question that just came in. And the question is, how do you follow up if you did not get an interview or you didn't get the job? You know, back um, in the day, it was like a handwritten note. Thank you for seeing me. And, you know, think about it. And yes. So where does that live? Does that does that type of communication still exist or do we just need to be like next? I think that it's nice to have some touch some 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 touches some contact touches as we say um so for example if they engaged you by phone and did a phone interview but then let you know you didn't get the job shooting an email saying thank you so much for your time i hope to be considered for future positions i think is totally fine okay. if you came in in person um and met with with the hiring managers or at least in this day and age like a zoomer or google meets like mm -hmm. virtual interview mm -hmm. i think it's more than fine to contact them to just thank them for their time mm -hmm. um and i think most hiring managers are actually kind of looking for that to kind of close the loop um but i would say if you have heard back that you haven't received the position following up months later or like repeatedly not so much, but certainly having that one touch base of just to thank the person for interviewing you, expressing again why you were interested in the position, wishing them luck on the placement, because honestly, uh, people start jobs and they don't necessarily continue with them for whatever that reason may be. People sure. have reasons they have to leave town unexpectedly. People uh, have illnesses, emergencies within their family. Like you never know when that job will reopen. And so if you really close the loop and have left things in very good standing with the people that you interviewed with, you could be the first call that they make when the job is reopened or when they have another job with another department, but within the same organization, you'll be someone. If if an organization is, is as diligent about hiring and keeping track of who they've spoken with and have a database of candidates, which almost all are now, I think back in the day, they really were kind of relying on pens and paper and not keeping track of those types of yeah. things. But now even with Excel, people can do it. So um I often talk to to clients who are saying, well, we have our database of candidates of people that have applied before. So we'll be able to cross check who you're sending us to make sure it's not somebody that we already have. So most people are are able to do that now, in which case you want to be one of those people that had reached out to them to thank them. Um, I, I think a handwritten note isn't, you know, necessary anymore. If anything, if you've interviewed like three or four times in person for a job and they didn't give you the job, I would think more so they would be giving you a thank you note um yeah. as as a <laughs> as an employer thank you so that's it's yeah. also give and take you know I always am telling candidates you know you don't have to feel like it's just about you being evaluated and judged it's also a chance for you to evaluate the organization yeah. and the only way you can evaluate it is by the interactions you have with their staff and through the interview process so it goes love, both ways I love that you said that you know we don't have a lot of time I want to make sure that we get to the formatting issue um and again sure. because People are doing this online in a digital capacity, formatting. Talk to us about this because you're saying use reverse chronology. And then you mentioned this earlier, but making sure that you link back to the duties and the tasks to drill down more efficiently what you're capable of doing, right? Sure. I, I cannot stress how much 
a reverse chronological resume that's very straightforward. It's so much easier and quicker to read and evaluate than functional resumes where the issue is, and I think sometimes when I'm talking to candidates with those types of formats, it saves space, yes, which is great. But what ends up happening is as the person reviewing the resume, you're trying to piece together when this person did this job duty. For all I know, if you've just listed your jobs in the years, it could have been 15 years ago that you did this particular job duty. Right. And as recruiters, what I'm evaluating is what job duties and what skills you have most recently, what things have been done in the past, and how that lines up with the goals of the organization and, and what requirements the organization has given me. And the easiest way for me to see that is to see very comprehensively what you've been doing most recently. So the easiest way to do that is to do reverse chronology, start with your current or most recent position, list in a bulleted format the duties and tasks that you are responsible for, including any technical um, responsibilities or database management, any you know Microsoft systems that you used on the job and in what capacity, like all of that can be there. Okay. And as you go down the resume and we're looking at a job on the maybe the second page that's from 2005, maybe it has less bullet points than the ones that are higher up. Like I think the most robust descriptions, if you're worried about space, are gonna be the ones that are, are the most recent. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of pare it back if it's for you know, a job that's from your you know distant past or start to weed some of those jobs off if they don't apply to the particular job that you're applying to. Like if it's, if it, you know, as I was saying before, if it's something that you would say during the interview, it's great to have it on your resume, even if it is old information. But if it really doesn't pertain to the particular job and you are looking to save space, I'd rather have more information on your most recent job and less on jobs that you've had previously. So then that kind of dovetails to highlighting mm -hmm some of these other things. And, you know, Jarrett and I are always coming up with uh, connecting to people that are in professional organizations that really do continuing education within their professional or organizations. Um, this doesn't seem to be something that we used to really spend time on. And again, maybe it was like a space issue, but mm -hmm. share with us in the, in the few minutes we have left uh, how you see this going. Sure. I, I think that this is really crucial for people who are trying to, uh, career shifters who are moving into the nonprofit sector. Okay. Uh, how else do you show an interest or passion within a sector that you've never worked in? One way is through volunteering, um, professional organizations and groups like Women in Development or Association of Fundraising Professionals, any networking groups you belong to, certifications that you've re received, courses at the foundation center or higher education that you take in professional development courses, all of those things when it comes to nonprofits are really important. The corporate side, I think that they also can be important, but I would be less familiar with what those particular things are. But for nonprofits, volunteering isn't just a hobby. It's something that helps their organization run. And so if you've been doing that at your church or synagogue or, um, or if you've been um, volunteering for Dress for Success every year for the past 10 years, those are things that are actually quite valuable on a resume. And I don't think that you have to belabor the point. They can be in one small section where you describe all of your networking experience, all of your volunteer experience, and it doesn't have to take up a lot of space, but it's great to have it on there. If Again, it's something that you would highlight during an interview. And it's something that you would say, hey, you know what? I'm actually interested in your organization because I've done X, Y, Z with this other organization. That's something that you can use for your cover letter. We're always looking for fodder for a cover letter rather than, again, mm -hmm. sending a canned, canned letter. Those are the types of things to incorporate in them. Okay. I have one last question for you. Sure. And that is to put a picture on or not to put a picture on. What is the standard now? Um, European resumes often come over with 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 photos attached to them. Um, mm -hmm. And I usually give them, if I see that they've worked in Europe, I give them a pass on that. I think it's it's dangerous territory to, because it's that, it's, it's that formatting, uh, you know, culture yeah. there. I think for us, for the most part, no pictures, no like identifiers about your personal demographics, anything like that. I think for the most part, it's not viewed as professional. And also it just is sort of asking for some level of discrimination, not that people would ever intend to have discrimination, discriminatory yeah. practices, but it can lead to that. Even just in the fact that you're unfamiliar with the, the general professional formatting of resumes, mm -hmm. it's unusual. And, and nowadays you can save it for LinkedIn because almost all the hiring managers are going to go there anyway. 
Great. Right. Well, Thank I feel like we need a part two because we went really fast over the last two and both Julie and I had way more questions <laughs> to ask you. And I'm grateful that we even had um, a, one of our viewers chime in. This is exactly what this format is for. Mm -hmm. So please check out Dana Skurlock and Staffing Boutique. That is staffingboutique.org. Director of Recruitment, Dana, thank you. You're always fantastic yeah. to you know, me nerd out with it's, it's always great. And I do think that this topic is something that we need to continue mm -hmm. because the market is changing just mm -hmm. as fast as technology is changing. And so mm -hmm. we need to stay on, you know, ahead of that when it comes to our resumes and seeking fruitful employment. So thank you for being here today. No problem. It's always a pleasure. So good to see you both. Thank you so much, Dana. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, jo been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jared R. Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Again, amazing sponsors that joined us today to have this conversation with Dana. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out as we um, come up upon, Jarrett, drum roll, brrr, our 1,000th show. I know, March 5th. It's right around the corner. Right around the corner. All right, everybody. We like to end every episode of the Nonprofit Show with this message. And it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. <laughs>